I've never thought about this more, this one issue more than what I'm hiring now in 35 years of hiring. It doesn't matter how much I pay you. If you just look at what you do each day for what you get, that's not how it works. If there's fewer fish in the pond, right, and fewer of them are keepers, you need to restock the pond because we need a healthy, robust industry. Strong companies, lasting partnerships, powerful events. Welcome to the Experience Builders Podcast. All right, gentlemen, we've already been going around and around for 20 plus minutes. This is an exciting topic, just talking about employee expectations, but also in reality, employer expectations when it comes to hiring, when it comes to what we can expect on the job and inside of our companies. And I think that you guys have two wonderful perspectives as longtime members in this industry, as employers in this industry. And so I just want to start the conversation around what are employee expectations and really what were they before COVID? Because we're living in kind of two different eras right now. So before COVID, Michael, let's start with you. What did you expect from employees and uh, you know, what was the mindset of employees and, and yourself as an employer? Yeah, I think I, I think I built my company on the concept of hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And then when you're talented, work harder. You know what I mean? I, you know, I'm the opposite of like, once you're talented, you don't have to work so hard or you can be more efficient. Um, I believe in doing the next day better. So the way I looked at my team and the way that I decided to grow my company is let's create an organization where I could come into the organization at any time in my career and have advocacy for where I am, what I can contribute while the organization, organization simultaneously um, works with me to help me find my way forward, right? But the basic ingredient for that was I have to show up, right? I Like how I show up is part of how the company has to show up for me. And so we created these systems and processes to make sure that, you know, nobody was really passive in that activity for very long. We're really good at it now, but that's what we used to talk about pre-COVID. So we had a lot of, we hired highly engaged people, um, a lot of people that um, would literally fall on the sword to get the job done. And there was less of this daily, weekly, or monthly, um, I don't know what you call, like uh, taking, you know, score or keeping score, like, you know, how much is my company asking from me uh, relative to what I'm giving? Um, I think people were, and that's sort of indicative of our industry, people were just, this is how it's always worked. You know, there's, you know, I'm available we can get this done. A lot of really amazing sort of people in our industry. Um, the people that weren't willing to do that kind of work, there was someone else willing to do it, right? So it was just our norm. And uh, I would say that's pre-COVID um, it, and it's changed a little post-COVID. Yeah, anything, are you in agreement there, Chris? What was it like for you? No, I, well, first of all, to Michael's point, it's a team sport, right? If you're in the, the trade show and event business, it's a team sport. So you, you always just count it on. I think Michael's right. There, there's, there's less keeping score of what your written job description duties were. You were so easy to reach into the gray on both sides of you. And just because at the end of the day, we get judged as one, right? We knew the clients judges wanted on how that event was. By the way, I want to, first of all, thank you, Michael, for coming back. I, those of you that are, uh, on time experience builders, listeners, um, Michael's a, re a recurring guest. Um, Khalil, you have the toughest job. You're like the science lab monitor right now because you've got both shells and muric acid in the beaker, <laughs> right? And, you know, or it's, you know, the two liter bottle of Pepsi and the roll of Mentos mints, right? You just got to keep us from getting hurt because once we get going, it's um, going to be tall so, order for sure. Super grateful for Michael being back. Um, but yeah, you know, what did I, what was my expectations prior to um, COVID? 
perfection. Damn it. Um, <laughs> no, I, but I think it was, um, there seemed to be more of an understanding of when you join a, a small business in the trade show and event space, you really are joining a team and you get to learn what everybody does. It was, it does seem that post COVID there's, um, there's a bit more, I'll, I'll, I'll call it awareness of what each role is in the boundaries of staying within that. And maybe that's because, you know, not to get off on this tangent, but maybe because there's been such a discussion in the last several years about boundaries and identity and protocols that we're met, we're much more aware even in the, in job by job of what that means. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about everybody in my organization right now, and there's nobody I'm, I'm looking at that I go, oh, I wish that person would reach a little bit more into the gray. Um, Cause I think generally speaking, they all do, but um, we still are looking for critical thinkers, right? Because that's what we are. We're problem solvers and project managers. Um, and that's not a, that doesn't, it doesn't write cleanly in a job description. A lot of it is reacting to circumstances beyond your control. Um, so, I, uh, but but it does. I, I think I said off off mic. Um, I do notice that I've got more people willing to. Maybe the day's quiet enough. I can get out the door at four thirty or at five. There didn't seem to be um, as great a hurry or as big an opportunity to leave early three days a week or four days a week. Um, and, and it's not early. It's a, it's a normal day, but for most people, we're just not in the normal day job business. So but I think, so when you ask about expectations, um, is it, you know, are, are employees falling short of expectations? Are employers or at least those of us that existed pre COVID you know, do, do we have expectations that are overreaching? Um, just the fact that we, we, we all agreed this was a, a meaningful topic makes me realize something's got to be a little bit off because we, we all feel like this is a worthy right. topic of conversation. So that's, For sure. that's kind of the mindset I'm at as we enter this, Khalil. My, Michael, what are you seeing? You know, you, you talked about the pre-COVID as far as post-COVID. What's changed? All right. Well, I want, I want to add one more thing about pre-COVID and I want to, sure. the analogy is we, we were living on an island with very uh, relatively predictable erosion in an aging workforce, hmm. but the island was fertile and rich and there's, there was plenty of food. You know, we were, we were eight years into, you know, the cost of money was zero. Right. I mean, and yeah. so if you if you extrapolate just as employer, that means, you know, the parking lot at our offices, which was filled with late model cars. Right. People keep people could afford, you know, the transportation of choice. They were buying people were dabbling in real estate when if you went back 20 years, they would just be grateful to own a house. Right. So people were, you know, so the whole if the energy, the energy previous prior to COVID was the peak of, uh, in a lot of spaces. And um, so your employees, they have all the basic, they had all the basic concerns in life, but not um, a lot of volatility across a huge bandwidth, in my opinion. So post COVID, what you have is you have an employee or employees that either, if they're young, either live in a house where there was trauma around work life because of COVID or travel or family or aging family members that people couldn't see, right? I mean, it was just like catastrophic on a lot of levels when you just think about human psychology. Um, so that's a real thing. And so, it, and since we are face-to-face -face engagement and we're inextricably tied to the internal audience, our employees, the customer audience, the partner audience, and then what we do, um, we're feeling it like, you know, like nobody's business, like a school system would feel it or, you know, almost any institution where they're colliding with all sorts of different things. So post COVID, I think what I'm where we're at is I being a person who is, you know, leans towards optimism. 
there's a time on that for me. So, you know, as soon as, and I used to, I remember saying to Chris once, you know, I'm not pivoting. I just don't see it yet. And as soon as I saw it, January 1st, 2021, I hired back my core. You went folks. for it. Yeah. And then by June of 2021, I realized, wow, only about 12 of my 34 people are coming back. So we started hiring outside. So now we have, you know, 60% of our staff are people and I hire outside the industry unless it was a really compelling thing because I don't want to re-educate someone because we actually believe we have a way, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, I don't want to teach you a new language while you're consulting with me on why it won't work, right? So if that's, so that's sort of the foundation of where I am, um, now we're in this place where we're doing that. We're sort of moving and inspiring our employees to say, hey, this culture, this is our culture. But the rules that Chris and I learned or practiced that got us to the point we are, they don't apply or they need to be re they need to be communicated using different language because certain languages, you get a hard no. You know, uh, you're there's, we're actually in an environment where there's a strong dialogue outside the workplace that is saying they can't make you do that. You deserve, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, what I say is what it's going to, you know who it hurts the most? It hurts the extremes. It hurts the high achievers, the high performers. They will just, they'll just be working more. They're going to think they're getting freedom. And then they're going to find like, oh my gosh, I'm not that good at juggling my time. It felt good, but I'm working all the time. And they'll, they'll ultimately resent their employer. So Michael, the, can I ask you, is that a pre-COVID, is that a pre-COVID, post-COVID thing? Is it a generational thing? I mean, because I'll be honest, I guys like sm business leaders like us, we have that fond remembrance pre-COVID of, 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 of whether it's work ethic or the culture. I mean, Hill and Partners, your company, your special sauce was, and, and our company too, right? It's how we did business with each other. It's how we interacted. It's the way we collectively showed up. And so are you trying, so, you know, we're talking about expectations are falling short of it. Are your expectations that you're getting that culture back or are you going, I got to create a whole new special sauce mm -hmm. Well, well, I do have some evidence. And remember, I'm talking about uh, Khalil mentioned, you know, um, sort of the size and scale of this dialogue. And um, it's in a window of, you know, five, currently five times the size of my organization. So 40 people across three locations is nowhere near as complex as 200 people across right three locations or five locations are in one building. And I have great respect for the need for there to be, you know, sort of a vertical component to that thing, right? In a change of the chain of command. And I actually can imagine both those things. So think of my company, relatively flat organization, right? So um, with the exception of me, at least post COVID, everybody's in it and on it, right? So if they take on a leadership role to be in it and on it, they're right next to the people that they're wanting to work nights and weekends, right? They're, they're wanting that stuff. So what I would say to you pre-COVID is I would go like, really, are we being honest? Or did we have the luxury of long running employment where we called out the people that didn't match our culture? So people learned by having an idea about work where I'm I'm financially dependent on my job, so I will stay here. And out of that culling, the funnel, three years in, you might look at who was in here and may maybe for every three people you had, one has stuck. And the reasons why the other two left may be circumstantial, had to take care of my mother, all these things, but they didn't stay with you through it all, right? In other words, they had a reason to leaving and it may or may not have been just the circumstances. It just meant, might have been quietly saying, you know, I'm going to go work somewhere else that works for me. And then you're left with these tried and true, like hard and steel, like dragon slayers, right? And then we look at it and go like, people were like that. Now I think we're in this chapter 
with all this uncertainty, and human beings like certainty, and people are saying, geez, what would I, what would make me feel good? Well, what would make me feel good is if you had a company that had great culture and you put me first, like you saw me and you and you acknowledged me and you told, you know, you shared all my awesomeness. And by the way, I can leave whenever I want. Because because I need I, to do can me. I vomit on camera? Because I <laughs> like but no, I it's funny. I think we all even listeners too. We're going to recognize somebody like what you just described. And I'm, I say that tongue in cheek about being sick because yeah, I've seen that they're out there. And yet um, I can't build back what we need to. I mean, we are, we are, we are Marine force recon guys on the front lines of events. That's just my, you know, my model. And it's, it's not for the meek. And so um, I really don't mean this in any insensitive way, but there's, you're right. I, we have found way more no thank yous uh, as inter, when we look to interview and hire than we are finding, you know, kindred spirits and like-minded, um, you know, PM warriors, right? But can I, can I suggest, Chris, that um, so um, – doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We know that phrase works. So, or that phrase. So we can either do something different, but not really just call it different, but have the same energy around it. In other words, I don't think this will work, but this is what they want, which would be large organizations um, that just decide, you know, unlimited PTO work from home because they actually can absorb a year and a half to find out that that experiment doesn't work, right? But it, when you're a smaller business and you want to be nimble, but by the way, the world is saying you also have to have a structure system and processes, which is good because that's the evolution of business. So what I would say, and I've already tried this. So I was like, okay, what can I do differently? But I want the same result. So I, what I want, the result I want is a high level of advocacy for the people that are on my team for the what and why we do what we do. Like actually to believe that we create spaces and places completely about your brand through a process where our people become your people at a price not to exceed anywhere in the world. Getting them to say that and act it out and look like they mean it and, is yeah. not the same thing as getting someone who bumbles through it, but they totally get it. They totally mean it. They They're just not a spokesperson, yeah. right? Yeah. So- what I've realized or what I think is the case for a small business owner, like someone like you and I, like you and I actually interview the people we're going to bring in our organization, right? Yes. Yes. So for you and I, we have to say, what is the language? What is the level of communication? How do we structure our offering and the experience in our offering in such a way that we call out anybody who would try to pose or or pretend they carry the same values, beliefs, and and are interested in developing the level of or the core competencies that we need to exceed. Yeah. And you know, everybody has a different thing. So that's what I've been trying to do, and that's with mixed results too. What does that look like practically, Michael? You know, going through that interview process and trying to weed those things out as soon as they you have a face to face conversation with them. All right. So I so so appreciate the question. So the normal business practice is the sales funnel and they apply it to everything. So <laughs> if you have 50 candidates, this is the process you go. This is the language you use. And, you know, and, and then you get down to whatever and then you share the burden of interviewing so that you don't miss the things you don't miss. By the way, all of that stuff works until. Until half of the candidates could be called instantly. And then you need a person with wisdom, a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of experience to go like, there's something about this candidate, by the way, who actually did jump three jobs in the last two years, but there's something about them. And so what I learned is because I'm a, you know, I'm sort of a anomaly. And by the way, all business owners are anomalies. They aren't, you know, they, you know, they're freaks. Right. They're unicorns. Right. Because they want they, they literally have the gall to say, I can do, you know, I want to do all of this stuff. So anyway, 
when I'm interviewing people, I'm looking for reasons why this isn't a good match for them, not me. And then I hit them with it. If you say to a human being, you know what? I love your attitude. I like, I like what you're saying, but I'm having a hard time understanding why this is what you would choose. Like, cause you deserve to your next best opportunity. And it flips, it flips the, the dialogue and you know, I stumbled on it. And then you get a lot of sharing when you're like, so either someone advocates advocates for it or they go like, wait a second, this isn't how an interview is supposed to go. I'm supposed to get you to give me an offer so I can tell the other person you're offering this because my life's about the next thing and the amount of money I get. You won't work in this industry. Like you literally will not work in this industry. It doesn't matter how much I pay you. If you just look at, you know, what you do each day for what you get, face-to-face -face engagement the restaurant business. There's like so many industries where that's not how it works, um, in my opinion. So if that's what you want, go work for an insurance company or a bank or the federal government. And, and by the way, have a very dependable, predictable life with a certain level of certainty, right? Because you can do what you do. And it's no judgment. I just think this is the kind of invitation that it's, it's not that it's special or it's awesome. It's awesome to us, but it's for a certain kind of person. And I am finding them in different places of all different ages. Michael, let, let me jump in and ask you, if you're trying, if you're trying to align expectations and, and these hires, right. And I love, you've always had such a, you such an interesting style when you're interviewing. And like you said, of flipping that meeting and then really pulling out, I think, the good stuff, the authentic reasoning about why somebody's there applying at your company. Um, so different expectations now. You have them. Employees typically have them. We're trying to close the gap between expectations and, and, and performance. So is it changing? I know it does for you. Is it changing or should it change how people are interviewing? At the oh, very first encounter. Absolutely. I think it changes how people are interviewed. We're in the we're in the development process. Again, small organization. So the annuity on your investment in a human being is hard to harvest in 18 months, right? So you really have to look at like, I got to pick the right people. Yeah. And I'm going to have to connect with them regularly. And I cannot be distracted by the illusion of tenure. So if you find someone whose resume says, I've been in this industry for 10 years, I think as an interview, you have to go like, all right, so what have you been doing? Tell me what that experience was like. You know what they stop at is, you know, I handled uh, $400,000 worth of business in the first quarter and exceeded expectations by 20%. Um, we're not in the banking business, right? What I want to know is, did you do anything in the second quarter? Like, or are you leaving out the fact that there is there is cyclical activity and that you under you know you sort of learned how to be productive during times of great demand or no demand and you understand the difference and you've built a skill set you know how to make the the experience different for other people there's a million things and it's really hard to get to that dialogue with a person who doesn't want to have it and they exist in the tenured pool and the brand new college graduate pool I've found my people in both. I have found people that are 15 years in their professional career and I've looked them in on and I've literally said like, I think this is an amazing opportunity for you. And okay, this is how me, I- Okay, so let me jump in and ask you a question. Cause you asked me earlier, cause I said, we're having probably better than average results with employees and, and, and meeting up with expectations. And I'll call it my- my old school pre-pandemic expectations of, I don't want you to just be great at the job. I need great role models and people that add to the culture and all of that stuff. So you asked me earlier, because you said, you know, you're in a very, you have a lot of specialized positions. You said, what's the average tenure or experience level? How many years of an employee at your company? And is that making, because you can't, you've got a lot of positions, you can't fake it with the new. And so when I go through and I look at, just mentally a quick check. I've got a lot of folks with 10, 12, 15 years minimum experience 
which I got to be honest, I go back and forth about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because I know, I love that you know how to do it, but we're not doing it anywhere near the same way we used to do it. Our offering right. is different. And so I, I worry about bad habits coming in uh, or bad mindset, maybe is a better way. Um, and yet, you know, you're saying you're finding both. You're finding the tenured, but you're also bringing in the brand new. And um, and I'll be I'll also say this, man, I've never thought about this more, this one issue more than what I'm hiring now in 35 years of hiring. I, maybe that's maturity. I am caring more about finding the right people and making sure not only that can they do the job that we're offering, are they going to be happy? Because I know what unhappy looks like on the rest of your culture, right? If you well, let... is it yeah? Isn't it also fair to say that? And again, I want I always feel like you remember I used to say I'm just a guy, and what I meant when I said I was just a guy is I am com infinitely aware of the fact that I play in a space that is not universal to business, right? Yes. So it's a lot easier to have a finite, or I should say a a more robust process that is the introduction to brand in the small business arena when you're only, when you're looking for your next person or you're looking for two people, knowing you may have a half a person attrition. So four people to lose one or what, something like that. The frustration for people that are like business owners, you know, and they want all business to be the same rules is that's not scalable. I'm not saying it's not scalable. What I am saying is, all my peers, the people that I admire, they are small business owners who understand what they're good at and what they're not good at. And they're living under the illusion that the rules of tenure, experience or whatever work. And I just say, vet that experience. Like vet it is, are you, are you um, conflating experience with wisdom? Because experience gets you somewhere, right? If you know what a cam key is in our industry, bravo, right? But if you spin out every cam that you touch and you're, you know, you're a bull in a China shop and you don't understand, like if you just break everything that you touch, people, things, I don't care how much experience you have, right? I'm right. interested in how you process the workplace. So that's what I want. And, you know, it's super idealistic, right? I want to I want to live and work in a place where someone who's been in the industry for six months is telling their peers, this is the greatest job I've ever had. While I simultaneously want someone who's been doing it for 15 years going like, wow, I am learning so much. That's, it's almost impossible, but I'm getting evidence. I just had, you know, so we had a 90 day daily recap from a, this young girl, Chloe, she hit her 90 days, which is a point at which our new employees no longer have to do a daily recap on their experience. I want to want you to make meaning of what that means. It's not to check on them. It's to create a tribal organization. And she said to me, one of my biggest concerns coming to work for this company is that my talent as a graphic designer would not meet the expectations that were set when I was, you know, considering the um, opportunity and the way they communicated what needed to be done. And she said, I'm proud of myself that these 90 days have happened. What I was totally surprised about was how much of this company and all these people, she, her, she didn't use advocate, would work on my behalf and support me in the process, right? So guy sitting up in the, you know, on the balcony, looking down on it at that moment going like victory, right? There's a young person who came in, they're questioning their ability to connect. And the surprise is that all these people wanted me to succeed, not the HR department, because we aren't those people, right? We aren't 5,000 employees and gee, the HR department was great, but my manager was an asshole, right? That's what's happening in bigger business. We don't have that luxury. Was the your company, is, were you that company before five years ago, Michael? Were you this well, good at everybody caring about the onboarding and the development in that first 90 days before, or is this new? No, no, I love it. So, you know, I love that question. So about 10 years ago, I read the book, Tribal Leadership, which I'm not saying is a 
how to run your business. In fact, every book I ever read, Chris, we talk about this. Yeah, we do. It's the little jewels that become like creative curve that become the raw materials from which you draw to create your own, right? Right. So one of the things I loved about the term tribal and think that may be socially unacceptable to say. I think <laughs> it's something to admire. And well, what if you're I want Daniel to Schneider te- and the Washington Redskins, I think you're on the fence on that. You're right. Yeah. So <laughs> what the 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 jewel from that book was they talked about, and I can't even it's been so long. The meaning I made of it is a different thing happens when three people, the three of us right now, are in a dialogue versus two people. And if one of the person is the influencer, then what occurred in that exchange is completely different with the two members. You get three and it creates a little bit more honesty, integrity and integrity in the process. Right. So if you're tribal. What you're doing is you're adding stakeholders, more stakeholders or more stakeholders, even in the dialogue, into the engagement, and it creates a richer engagement, right? And it's not to say that dinner for two isn't fun, because Chris and I, we like we live in the dinner for two thing, right? Morning calls after coffee, and we have a blast. But when we want to take that dialogue and engage with a third party, it's almost like we have to modify the language, right? We have to talk, we have to be conscious of that third party unless it's another crazy person, right? But so the, so the tribal thing, I preached it for six years, and I had more people were like yeah yeah yeah, but their whole life they were hub and spoke people. If I influence this person, if I influence this person, and then I tell you if I go Khalil. By the way, I talked to John and I talked to Mary and I talked to. Jimmy, and this is what they think, or this is what we think. But if you talk to John, you're like, this is what, and and you found out what Mary was talking, they'd be like, we had a different conversation. It would be because I'm the person wanting to control the narrative, right? Yeah. Um, So what I sought to do is eliminate as much as possible the one-on-one engagement around things that are impactful to the organization. We, uh, We are better bad at that. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And not only do you get better engagement, but you get more ownership, you know, and when, and people want autonomy and ownership inside of their role, they want to feel proud of the work they do. And they also want to be challenged. There's probably things that they're encountering every single day that they've never had to go through before, but that's exciting. It give it makes it a, a richer experience for them when they come to work. What am I going to jump into today? Well, how yeah. can I help the team? You know? And, yeah. and so those are all great things. Obviously, you have to arrive the right players that are engaged enough to do that, like you've already talked about. I want to go back to, you know, a lot of the things that we we talked about before this, just in terms of what switched in the market in after COVID, right? Like we saw so many companies out there now competing for talent that previously weren't competing against each other because of remote work. Uh, that's still an after effect of COVID that's really lasted in many areas of the the workforce. Uh, not necessarily in, in our industry, but even in our industry, it has impacted it till today. So you ha- you're competing with, you know, now the remote work aspect and then the other benefits that all these companies in other industries were offering, unlimited PTO, profit share, uh, other compensation packages. And then you you also include just the the increase in compensation across the board. That was a lot of change to our industry in terms of the hiring market. And I think for a lot of, we've, we've talked about this, but for a lot of employers, when you start trying to compete now with those things, you just ponied up a lot of things <laughs> that you're offering to people now. You're expecting a little bit more back value-wise. And is that creating a misalignment of expectations or are business owners justified in saying, hey, I'm, I'm shelving out a lot here. Do you understand the risk that I'm taking by bringing you on? Do you understand how much I'm giving to you? I I should demand a certain level of expectations from you. So how do where do we stand on that, guys? You know, uh, wow, that's a great um, observation, Khalil. And I think, um, yes. So whether it is market conditions that has driven 25, 30, 50% increase in compensation, 
I think it's human nature for a business leader is going to go, I'm now paying, you know, 35% more for a project manager to do the job. So you have an expectation that maybe you're getting more. And yet if you're coming in from a different industry or you're coming from a large company to come to work at a small company, um, you're not necessarily thinking it's because I'm going to be doing way more work. You're just, Michael said it earlier, this might just be what the cost of people showing up for those jobs is now. And if it is, um, and, and there's some instances I, I can feel that that's it. I, I feel the progress in my own mindset, um, being realistic about some of what we've, you know, we've recently hired a couple of production managers. We've hired several senior project managers. We've re-engaged with designers, whether they're full-time or freelance, the rates are completely different. Um, executive team leaders are, you know, it's anyway, it's, a, it, it, there's a significant spend and you're right. Um, sort of depressing to think that it's just the cost of them showing up. That's what it is nowadays, but it's, a, but, but it's a factor. Um, I still, I still think I, d I don't really mind the spend um, if they're a good fit and they can do the job and you're right, hire grownups, Khalil, and let the grownups do the work. And then my job is to, is the guy above the treetops on overwatch. You just have to watch and listen and see how people interact and look for ways to encourage bonding. That's why I'm fascinated by some of the things Michael was saying. I mean, when you have a young employee at 90 days that goes, I was blown away by how many people were invested in me becoming successful just to this point. And isn't that an amazing, and yet, um, you know, like the young, young NBA stars that don't want to be the role model, even though they get the big checks, there are some people that go, well, why am I training your employees? I don't want to, I don't want to be that. And um, real, real quick on the, on the whole kinds of, so I think I may have talked on our last call that we have this thing that started shoot almost 18 years ago, the Falcon award, which is this, so, you know, there's the Liberty walking silver dollar. And uh, it was when I bought the company from my partner and we had been partners for 12 years, all of a sudden I was um, thrust into this role of CEO, but really head account and project manager, right? But I'm the CEO. I was 50, 49% owner of a company that had, you know, 17 or 18 people and basically mom and, mom and pop revenues. But I, um, I got one of those coins and stuck it in my pocket. And it sounds very cliche, but I'm a distracted person. I'm a shiny object person. So I carried this coin every day. And it was my reminder to do something that remotely re resembled leadership or CEO, not account manager or project manager. And here I am, you know, a two-year associate degree, a four-year college dropout, and no MBA. Thank God I don't have an MBA. <laughs> And the reason why I say that is it really takes a special kind of per person to be in this in the smaller business entrepreneurial role and sort of set the scaling, you know, success is building scaling and sort of be in the work and say, what is, the, you know, what, what's the universe providing for me? How do I want to bend time and space to make it different? But that coin I carried around, it eventually got stuck to a trophy called the Falcon Trophy because mm -hmm. my father's. My father had a friend, my father's passed away, but he had a friend who used to go down to spring training every year for the Red Sox. And over 20 years, he had several of these bats that he would have signed at spring training. And he had some bats that had signatures from people that were world-class athletes for various franchises, right? Because spring training is young rookies and everything. And these things were like unobtainium. They weren't the same thing as the, you know, the, the World Series team signed this bat. It was this piece of art that had all different. And I was like, how do you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? We're going to get a trophy. We're going to do this Falcon thing. I'm going to ask people to look at their work the same way I looked at mine and, and understand it's, you're going to have bad days. Stick it on that trophy. And if we give you a Falcon award, which is the coin, you get to sign that thing. We now have three of those. They're in our three locations. There's two little ones. And then there's this one we've added with bottom two, like this, you know, like some of these trophies, you know, yeah. and they're covered with signatures. The point of the story is um, 
once you get a Falcon, it's really hard to get the second Falcon because there's no mandate to give it and it's for exceeding expectations. So as the company's expectations increase, these people are doing work with our customers that I couldn't do. That's how with technology and with the integration of things, Chris probably has a greater aptitude with the actual get it done thing than I do, but I'm interested in it. But I'm like, wow, this person who's been with us 15 months is doing a $2 million 30 by 30 and managing all the partners. And I used to be a guy who showed up with a, you know, a Swiss army knife and, uh, you know, and a pair of pliers and I could get four guys and we could put something together. So that idea of recognizing people, what I say, and it's a long story, but what I say to people when you get, and when you get the Falcon and my number, you know, I think the other people in the organization, they just see it as a trophy for something. So I have to keep saying this. Hey, by the way, we really are honoring you going above and beyond our expectations. The next one's hard to get because we already expect that now. Right. And if you think about someone like the girl I referenced, um, she has not received a Falcon Award, but she's been a high achiever. I don't know if she'll ever receive one, but the message in life should be like, wow, now that you do it, just don't go walk around with your special toolcase of all the things that you were doing are awesome and expect them to play. But the same things will get rewards for a person who has much less experience. So I think there needs to be more of that in the workplace. And I will tell you, less and less people want it. More and more people just want the award. Like, how do I get that recognition? And then I even have people on my team who go like, hey, you know, so-and-so's never had a Falcon. And I go, so we either haven't noticed them exceeding expectations or they're just doing the job we're paying them to do. They don't get right? the trophy for just showing up. Right. Right. And so all those things contribute to, you know, now I, so I've said before, I have a very clear, you know, to Chris, I have a way it's just my, you know, the way yeah. I think it should be. And I'm hoping I invite enough people that want to do it this way pretty click quickly when they're in your organization they kind of want to morph it into their own way. And then I'm there still in the, you know, this is my biggest fear as a, as a company owner is for me to do the next thing. Do I let go of my values and beliefs and let sort of other people modify it? Um, what happens in that case, a lot of times is things you see this in fortune 500 companies. What they do is they get a bunch of people who turn it into better sameness right? Like we're going to be just a little better than all these companies that do the same thing. Well, it loses its mojo, right? Yeah. And then it just uh, entropy occurs. And I think where we are, the last thing I'll say about this post COVID is Chris and I are, you know, we're at that time where we're not working for another 25 years. So our, even our perspective is we have an expectation that may be different than when we were 35, now we're saying, give me enterprise value. Give me a return on all this time I've worked. I have the scars to show it. I'm telling you how to do that. How come you're not listening? Mm. And, uh, you know, so we're over in the corner going, this isn't fair. Well, I celebrate, I, I celebrate what you've accomplished, Michael. You, you, it really, you know, we, we've had a, a broader conversation in the industry, but You've answered the question. You've created the culture that answered the question of why would somebody in your company care about the availability of other qualified employees or really good people? Why would they take the interest in, 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 in help coach them up and train them? And I think if you understand that this is a team game, you know, you know, if you're on the team and you've been at it a while, you know why you need that. But I mean, this is actually a broad and Khalil, I know you had something you want to say here, but I hope we, we finish up at the end with um, there's a broader discussion in our industry. Now, 2.8 million people laid off during pandemic um, 300,000 approximately never came back. We have a shortage. We have to repopulate our industry. And um, I know there are some business leaders that are suggesting, well, why would I care about repopulating an industry? It's just, dog eat dog world. We, I'm not going to help my competitors. I'm figuring out how to do, you know, find the people I need. We, we just want to let other, everybody, it's every man for himself, which by the way, I think that's, a, that's actually a symbol of recovery, right? Because 
we're getting back to that competitive nature of the way we were. My hope was um, I, I would make a good argument for the industry of why the industry needs to populate. Michael, I think you had made a comment about if there's fewer fish in the pond, right? And, and, and fewer of them are keepers. Um, it's a no brainer to me. You need to restock the pond, right? Because we need a healthy, robust industry, but um, you've, Anyway, I celebrate the fact that you've been able to create the culture just within the organization, all locations. Everybody's committing and is selfless enough to help the development. Maybe now it's because they had it done for them. But I think, you know, more than not, I bet it's the, the veterans that understand I'm going to be leaning on this person soon enough. Right. So you have to make the ponds ecosystem better, too. And you might have to feed. Right. So. I think that's the thing in our industry is we've been harvesting talent in this industry through serendipity. And now we're going, now we're going like, wow, we actually have to do more constructive work here than we ever have, have done before, which means we have to actually move and inspire people to choose this. We have to give right. examples of it yeah. while we're simultaneously lifting you know, some very relatively novice talent that we currently have, right? A, the huge chunk of the talent is new. So, um, you know, that's why they call it work. Yeah, yeah. for sure. A yeah. couple of things, just to go back to both of your responses to that question. Um, you know, Chris, you talked about how you now your labor has gone up 25% just because yeah. that's where the market's at and you're competing with other industries. Right. I think another frustration probably for business owners, and maybe they wouldn't have this frustration is that there are you actually passing on that to your customers are you increasing your prices 25 percent across the mm. board as you grow because at the end of the day you look at any other businesses out there they're passing on their costs to the customer they have to but a lot of small business owners will just say well i can't do that i'll lose the job yeah. i'll lose the work and those are the ones that are probably the most frustrated with employees who aren't meeting expectations so i think that's a huge part but then going over to what Michael had to say with expectations, which I think is brilliant. And I think it almost shows that next level of leadership uh, as an employer. But, you know, there's so many small business owners that really just fail to set expectations. And because there's no clear definition of the expectations, it leaves them frustrated and their employees confused. And ultimately, that's why they leave. Right. But then there are those yeah. that next layer that define expectations and that's great. There is a clear North Star for the employee, but the environment's not right. And that's exactly what you talked about, Michael, with just having a really great environment and being responsible for that environment that expectations are exceeding all the time because that's what everyone's used to. And it allows mm -hmm. people to thrive. It allows people to be called up, you know, rather than be called out. So mm -hmm. um, all great things. I want to end on this question, guys. Um, we, we talked about you know our expectations as employers maybe being misaligned with the market, maybe some reasons why and what we can do about it. But let's talk about the employees for a second and just put ourselves in their shoes for a minute, which is always a helpful exercise as an employer. What should employees be expecting when they come into a role? When you know they're demanding certain things like hybrid work or you know a, a higher level of pay, uh, pay whatever it is. What should they be expecting coming into a small business? Because uh, a lot of times they don't understand what it is like for the employer that's hiring them. So what should they inspect, expect? And if you're talking to someone that's just joining the industry as an employee, what do you want them to hear? I can, uh, well, I have a couple things really quickly. And I use this in interviews and I'm getting other people to say it. You know, just point of clarity here, um, we're not hiring a consultant. So, and I do that, I would like to say that I used to exclusively do that with college graduates because I had this affinity for young people and influencing and shaping. The problem is, you know, that system's broken a little bit. So I'm finding out that the the inbound college graduate that I'm talking to still doesn't have a lot of uh, mission driven approach to their lives. They're still discovering. Mm -hmm. And if on top of that, they have an entitlement gene like the basic thing is I should get to hang out here and get paid what I want and I'll, you know, I'll let you know. Right. You know, so, so what I say is this, this may be uncomfortable. I used to say it 
it, I practice it on young. I'm not asking for a consultant. However, I value what you see and your input. So we're going to go through this period and then my door is open. So you get past the 90 days and you've got a bunch of great ideas or you see things come in my office and share them with me because I'm not new to this company and I'm not seeing that. You know what I mean? But if they, you know, what happens, by the way, they rarely come because we're engaging them. But in a, a, what used to happen is people wanted to look at the company and tell us what we should be doing as a company when they come in, to, you know, to, when they enter. Now, when you have people with history and you do that to them, it's my way to get them to self-extract because I, people will say, I'm looking for this new chapter. I really want to get, a, get to a place where there's a community and everybody values. They say these things. And then I go, so, and then I do my consultant thing and you can see it like, well, wait a second. What they're wanting is I want to be in a company where I'm appreciated for my tenure and we all get along. Right. You know, I'm, and I'm, I'm, so, so to me, what should an employee expect is what I wish we would teach is um, a little more, give me a chance, you know, a little more like I, I've done all these things, but man, give me a chance at this. And how can they have that attitude of give me a chance at this if you haven't got them pumped up about the chance, right? So when I see people going, you know, before I give people to someone else in my company, I go, I have everything and nothing to do with you getting hired. But how do you feel right now? Oh, I really want, this sounds like a really good experience. And I go, so one thing I want you to remember, don't take this job if you think you're talking to a crazy person because I'm not going anywhere, right? So this is it. Even if you talk to someone and go, hey, you don't have to talk to them very much. This is it. So don't take it. And then I say, and don't take a job. If you don't take this job, if you don't, realize that you're you're playing in the bigs like these people beyond their bad their worst day which you can't judge them by they are really good at their work so come here and be really good like disney bloom where you're planted and then everything else happens that's a disney phrase hmm. i love it chris what do you have you know what I, there's five things i that leap to jump to mind i think okay. the primary thing any employer can provide you is training and opportunity Right. Um, we can you should be looking for compensation, obviously, competitive compensation that 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 matches what your the value you bring is. So there's a basic quality of life benefits that should be, I would think, included. I think if you're you're a, a developing contributor, that's a code Michael and I use for uh, somebody who's early on in their and their and their business career launch. Um, I think you should be looking for professional development opportunities, people you can learn from, a company that you can learn from. Um, I think, look, and Cleo, you talk about this all the time. I think you want meaningful work, you know, and I think what the employer can add there, the final thing really is perspective. Um, you know, if you're working in a, in a wood shop, um, it's great. I, I'm expecting that you enjoy doing that work, but we need to help you know, help you understand, you know what we do here in this building and, and, and we're an operations and, and build company. We help the world trade, right? That that's a very noble thing to do. Um, the work is fun. It's fast. It's visual. It's hard. Um, but it's work with purpose. But I think giving, giving em employees, particularly those new to the industry, some perspective of nothing in the world happens without sales the dishwasher at your house, the plates in the cabinet, the car in the driveway, the, the, the guy mowing the lawn, you, you know, the dinner out, all of it is based on a buy sell thing. And so uh, transaction in, in a moment. And so what we do is, you know, we create environments that allow those buy sell moments to happen. It's a, it's, it really is, I think a very noble thing. So just, mm. I think part of an employer's responsibility to set expectations properly is remind people that, you know, it's not just the thing you're doing at that desk or at that work table or out on the show floor. There's a, there's a greater purpose and be proud of that and take the joy in that. So I think that's a big part of it. All good things. All good things. Well, 
gentlemen, it's been a, a pleasure talking with you both. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on the Experience Builder Show again. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'd love to have you back again. I think this has been a great conversation for both the employee and for the employer. I think we've talked about things around expectations, but even just around best practices and uh, how to you know, operate your team efficiently, but also effectively. So uh, wonderful conversation and enjoyed having you. Hopefully we'll have you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, yeah. guys. Good to see y'all. Thanks for listening to the Experience Builders Podcast. Check out our website in the show notes or visit crewxp.com to learn more.